What's up, everybody? I am the Professor Junichiro Swanson, and today we are going to be covering a very detailed worked example from physics. It is a sort of homework or exam question that you may find in classical mechanics or in statics, and it is pertaining to static friction, so if you are in one of those courses, uh, you'll probably find it in the static friction unit of such courses. And if you got this question on an exam, it would probably be a final exam, and if a teacher is being fair, he'd probably give you 40 minutes for it. It looks like a simple question. This is actually the whole thing about this line, but it is actually sort of hard mode. And if you got this question on an exam, you probably would not want to be writing this many words on it, because you wouldn't have enough time for that. However, I decided that I'm going to write a whole lot of words on here, as, uh, in addition to the uh, equations and diagrams and such, and I'm also going to be uploading a scanned version of this. So this tutorial does include a little more uh, discussion than you'll find on these papers, and then you can watch that, and then afterwards you can read the scanned version to review it. And this example comes from the book called Applied Mechanics for Engineering Technology by Keith M. Walker, 8th edition, and it is number 719 in that book. There will also be some discussion of some topics you'll typically find in courses other than statics, such as formal logic, linear algebra, and TI programming. But just enough of those things to be super useful. If you have not studied any of these courses, even better, you're going to learn a lot today. All right, let's have a look here at what we are being asked to solve. We have this diagram here, there's a ramp, block B is resting on top of that ramp, block A is resting on top of block B, we've got angle 10 degrees here, 15 degrees here, 15 pounds and 5 pounds, and a force P here, and it says, determine the minimum force P that will cause impending motion, the coefficient of static friction for all surfaces is 0 0.25. So the way to think of this is, first imagine there's no force there at all, and we just leave these things here. Now, there are angles, but there's enough friction there that even though this ramp is at a little angle there and there's an angle here, there's enough friction that everything's going to be held static, no sliding yet. And now we imagine that we apply this force very, very gradually. Start with one little ounce of force pushing there. Uh, when it's one ounce of force, uh, it still won't be enough pushing to cause some stuff to be moving. There will still be enough fr friction to keep it static. And we imagine we inc increase that force a little bit more, a little bit more, and how many pounds will we be have to be pushing there before something starts to move? And the reason why this is sort of difficult is because there's two different ways that it might move, and we don't know which of those is the one yet. So let's call them mode 1 and mode 2. And now, just for a second here, let's imagine that the ramp is made of rubber, let's imagine block A is made of ice, and block B is made of a block of ice stapled rigidly to a block of rubber. And um, in this situation, the coefficient of static friction between these two surfaces would be very great. The coefficient of static friction between these two surfaces would be very slight. And now imagine that we start pushing block A with a force in this direction. And clearly, block A will slide to the left there, uh, while there still remains enough static friction here to, to prevent any movement between B and the ramp. Now, let's also consider mode 2. Suppose our ramp is made of ice, and suppo suppose that block A is made of rubber, and suppose that block B is made, of, again, of a block of rubber stapled to a block of ice rigidly, that they act as one body, but now that the rubber is on the top and the ice is on the bottom. Okay, so, and now we apply a force here, and clearly uh, what will happen is these two will move together, They'll, there will be sliding along this pair of surfaces here, but there will be enough static friction uh, on the rubber-to-rubber -rubber contact that those will stay together. Now, our question said that the coefficient of friction for all surfaces is 0 0.25, um, so that's what you'd get if basically all of them were metal. So that was just a little thought experiment where we imagined uh, mixing up the surface types. And here we have uh, on one page mode 1 and mode 2. Uh, Mode 1, sliding here, no sliding here, direction of motion here. Mode 2, uh, sliding here, no sliding here, direction of motion there. Okay. 
Okay, and these words here basically is just what I just said. Assume it's static when the force is zero. As it's applied, there's two different modes it might move with. This is just defining those two modes in words. And this says you can make any variation of this you want. Uh, we just uh, tried varying the coefficients of friction to get a good sense of the two ways this might start moving, but you could uh, switch up the angles, say that's 20 degrees and that's 35 degrees. You could say this one's 20 pounds and this one's 10 pounds. Uh, infinite variations on, what, on how you might vary this, and in some of those, mode 1 will happen, and in some of those, mode 2 will happen. Okay, now, our solution strategy. You have to start by guessing one of the modes. Um, let's say P1 is the amount of force that will cause it to move, assuming mode 1 is the mode that will happen. P2 is the amount of force that will cause it to move, assuming, assuming mode 2 is what will happen. Now, the simplest way to solve this is... Uh, find P1 and find P2. So that's assume mode one, find P in that mode, assume mode two and find P in that mode. And if you do that, you just compare the two and whichever one is less corresponds to the mode that will actually happen. And whichever one's more is the mode that won't happen. And there's a little variation on how you can do this. Because what you can do, if you have come up with your first guess and if you're confident in it, let's say we guess mode one, and let's say we're confident in that guess. What you can do, assume mode 1, find how much force P there to cause it to move in mode 1, and then instead of solving for P2 and, and doing all the considerations for mode 2, what you can do is you can then do a check. And now, if this check, if it passes, then uh, we know that mode 1 is the mode and we know the force then, then we have our full solution and we don't even have to start calculating things in mode 2. Now if you do mode 1 and then you do the check and now if that check fails, then you uh, that that means mode one actually wasn't the mode and then you have to do calculate mode two anyways so this is a little gamble and it decide it depends on uh, how confident you are with your guess now if you're very confident you take this gamble and you pass the check um, this check is a little less work than solving for p2 so if you win that gamble uh, then you've saved yourself a little bit of time uh, if you lose the gamble if you let's say you can um, confident that mode one is the mode and then you solve for mode one and do that check and if that check fails then you have to do mode two and you just cost yourself this much extra time over uh, this one. So this one you could call it hedging your bets and this one you could call it putting some poker chips on your on your first guess. Okay, still page one and at this bottom of page one I've basically started explaining that. So this is saying you can solve for P1 and solve for P2 and now on page two uh, this says the second part of the thing I just said. It says uh, you can solve for P1 and do that check, and then uh, if that check passes, then you don't have to solve for P2. Okay, so let's start with the guess that mode 1 is what will happen, and to foreshadow, it's not. Um, so in this solution, I am going to be actually doing the gamble. Uh, we'll do solve for P1 in mode 1, and then we'll do the check, and then the check will fail, and then we'll have to solve for P2 anyways. So that's why this is a very detailed solution. And um, what, the first time I actually came across this one and, and solved it, my guess actually was mode one and then it was wrong and then I did do that check and then I did do P2. Okay. So this again, in mode one, there's impending motion between A and B, and no impending motion between B and the ramp. So therefore in mode one, force of friction, um, when I say uh, F subscript FR, that's force of friction. When I say F subscript N, that's force normal or normal force. And AB means uh, the force from A on B. Uh, so this, and then one is short for mode one. So F, FR, AB, one means the force of friction of A on B in mode one. Mu is the coefficient of static friction and uh, force FNAB1 is the normal force of A on B in mode 1. Okay, so in mode 1, force of friction equals mu FN between A and B, but, and W's wall, but in mode 1, force of friction does not equal mu FN between the wall and B. Well, it's actually a ramp, but I always use W for a wall or a ramp. So FFRWB1 means the force of friction of the ramp on block B in mode one, F and W B one is force the normal force of the ramp on B in mode one. So what do I mean by this? Let's recall very simple situation here. 
let's say this is a very heavy weight, 10,000 pounds, there's a gravity force on it pulling down, the normal force pushing up, and because this is a horizontal surface, the normal force and the gravity force will be equal. And now let's say we push on this to the side with a very, very light force, and let's assume mu is 0.25, it's like metal on metal. If we push it with a very, very, very light force here, there will be a friction force here to counter that, but of course if this is a very light force and this is 10,000 pounds, so F normal is 10,000 pounds, F friction is a tiny, tiny force, obviously force friction over force normal is not 0 0.25, it's maybe 1 over 100. It's If I were to push this thing so hard that motion is impending, that's when the friction force is, we say, maxed, and then that's when the friction force equals mu times Fn, okay? So, mode one, in mode one we're assuming that as we apply this force, there's going to be sliding of A over B, along B, between these two surfaces. Because we're assuming that, that means that the force friction there is maxed, which means that between these two surfaces, force friction equals mu times Fn. But there's no sliding here, which means the friction here is not maxed, which means that there is some amount of friction force uh, resisting this motion here, but since it's not maxed, force friction is not equal to mu Fn, force friction is less than mu times Fn in mode 1, assuming that's what happens. And, you know, uh, as I foreshadowed, it's not what happens, but since we're calculating P for mode 1, we, we use all these assumptions that pertain to mode 1. Okay, let's get to work. If we do a free body diagram of A and then do force balances and math, we can find min P for mode 1, but then a check is necessary. Okay, so this is body A. We got four forces here. The gravity force, force P is inclined 10 degrees to the horizon that way. And these two are along with this surface here. This surface is inclined five degrees to the horizon that way. Force friction is in line with it. Force normal is perpendicular to it and they're perpendicular to each other, these two. Now I said uh, here AB and here I've said BA. Okay, this AB means of A on B. BA means of B on A. And because of uh, Newton's third law, we know those are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So whatever the force of friction of B on A, when we consider B, the, f the force of friction will be in the opposite direction. Normal force of B on A is this way. Normal force of A on B, when we consider B, it will be that way. Okay. Now, uh, we know that force friction is mu times force normal. That's for these two, uh, between A and B. Um, and we know mu is 0 0.25, so we know exactly the ratio of this to this. That means whenever this one appears in an equation, uh, as soon as this appears in an equation, we can just sub in 0 0.25 times this. So we can always eliminate this in the equation and, and turn it into one of these. Because of that, we can consider these two as one unknown. So how many unknowns are in this system? There's this one effectively here, and one more here. That's a total of two unknowns. And if we do two force balances, like in X and Y, for example, that's two equations in two unknowns, and that means we can solve for all of those. Okay. Um, when I said a check is necessary. Okay, so we got two equations and two unknowns, and we can solve for P, and then we'll have P1. Um, and then we wouldn't even have to do a, a free body diagram of B before finding P1. However, um, like in that uh, two possible strategies thing, if then you're doing the hedging your bets mode, you just go right into mode two and do whatever you need to do to solve for P2. If we're doing the gamble where we do the check, that means we gotta consider uh, block B in mode one. And we'll, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you what that is later, what that check is. Okay, so let's call the orthogonal directions X and Y. And let's define an inclined coordinate system U and V. And let's say that's inclined 10 degrees to the horizon this way. Uh, that's going to isolate this. Uh, it's not going to isolate these. But let's just look ahead to our free body diagram of B. Uh, it's, it's also going to line up with these. So it's going to isolate it's, uh, this, this, and this. It's not going to isolate these. But that's how we get the, the most amount of isolating things with an inclined coordinate system. Now, after this solution, I'm going to show you a solution that relies heavily on uh, solvers for systems of linear equations. Um, however, in this uh, first solution, the first time around, I'm going to assume that 
Our only algebra skills are adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and calling sine and cos. And I'm not going to assume we know any more math than that. So that's why I want to use inclined coordinate systems to isolate things, because I'm assuming that I want to simplify the algebra as much as possible. Okay, and the force normal of A on B in mode 1 is equal to the force normal of B on A in mode 1. Uh, and if you replace those both 1s with 2s, that would also be true. And we know that by way of Newton's third law, because they're equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And a little note on notation, we could use F with a hat to refer to a force with direction, and F just a letter to refer to just the magnitude, or we could use F just a letter to refer to a force with direction, and F between vertical bars to refer to just the magnitude. Let's just use the notation F in all cases, or really in a diagram like this, we could say, oh, the arrow refers to the direction, and the letter F refers to just the magnitude in an equation or in a diagram, and now we're not using uh, one name to mean two different things. Okay, this here is just needlessly verbose. This shouldn't really be here. It's just saying force friction between A, A, B, of A on B or of B on A equals mu times force normal of A on B or of B on A, and both of those are equal to a quarter times force normal just because mu equals a quarter. There's, there's no reason for that to be there. Okay, next page. Let's resolve force of gravity, force normal of B on A, and force friction of B on A into U and V components. And that's what this is here. So if there's a force of gravity, it's straight down, and we're going U component and V component. There's the force normal, it's up at this angle, U component, V component, and the force of friction, it's at this angle, U component and V component. Now, remember, when you are resolving something into components, you want the arrowheads to be like saying, uh, this arrow goes from here to here, or this pair of arrows goes from here to here. So this start and the end in the same place. I mean, this path and this path both start here, both end here. So you want the arrowheads like that. As opposed to when you're doing a force balance, uh, a geometric one, like let's say you have three forces and you know that they're balanced and you want to do a geometric solution of that, then you want the arrowheads going in a cycle like that. Um, okay? So make sure you don't get those mixed up. Okay, now, um, if uh, you don't want to skip any steps, you know, you might say, oh yeah, what, so Katoa sine is uh, opposite over hypotenuse, and then solve for that component, uh, so Katoa cos is adjacent over hypotenuse, and then solve for that component. If you are in grade 10 math, then your teacher would probably want you to show all these steps, but we can... Uh, skip a little step. It's such a small step that you could call it skipping a half step and you can call that perfectly ac acceptable. I'm not a big fan of skipping too many steps. But just remember that when you're breaking something into components, like say U and V components, one of those components is always going to be the original times the sine of something and one is always going to be the original times the cos of something. So you're never going to have this term divided by this term or this term divided by this term. Okay, so this force here, this component is the original times the cos of this angle, and this component is the original times the sine of this angle, and likewise, the component is the original times the cos of some angle, and the component is the original times the sine of some angle. Okay, so this gravity force, it's 5 pounds, and I've reported these components as 5 sine 10 degrees pounds and 5 cos 10 degrees pounds. So let's talk about indicating the units. Uh, this is what I just did there, and this is perfectly fine notation. You could also say 5 pounds sine 10 degrees and 5 pounds cos 10 degrees. This is perfectly fine notation as well. In both of these cases, uh, it's a force, it's in pounds, and the rest of the things are unitless numbers. Now you can report these components as, oh, this component's 5 sine 10 degrees and this component is 5 cos 10 degrees, as long as you put a note somewhere that says all force units are in pounds. This is acceptable. I don't prefer it. Or, if you really wanted, you could report them as 5 sine 10 degrees and 5 cos 10 degrees and not include any note on the units, like saying they're all in pounds. This is not acceptable. And some people will tell you it is acceptable. They're wrong. My preference is to uh, indicate units a lot of the times when it's optional. This is from a different course, uh, homework from a very long time ago, but I like to even go as far as including all these big convolutions of units here and making sure they resolve into the unit type that it is expected. I, I think it's a useful check as, as well as uh, just good practice. And it's sort of like grammar or 
let's think of it this way, the classic textbook logical argument. Premise 1, all men are mortal. Premise 2, Socrates is a man. Therefore, conclusion, Socrates is mortal. Um, this is a valid argument. The truth of the premises uh, guarantee the truth of the conclusion. Okay, uh, let's say, premise 1, all men are mortal. Premise 2, Socrates. Therefore, conclusion, Socrates is mortal. This is not a valid argument. There's something in this study of logic called not even wrong. Well, premise 2 here, this is not even a statement, so it's not even wrong, but it turns the whole thing into a, an invalid argument just as well as if you had an incorrect statement there. Uh, you do get to the right conclusion, but since you uh, bungled that, it turns your whole thing into an invalid argument. Likewise, if you report that this force is equal to some unitless number and then just throw the word pounds in at the end when you got to your solution, you've just turned your whole solution into an invalid argument. It's not a cool thing to do. You could call that pedantry. I call it good practice. And while we're on that topic, let's also mention uh, keeping exact values. Uh, here's what I've just done. I've reported these as 5 sine 10 degrees pounds and 5 cos 10 degrees pounds. If you prefer, you can start throwing in numbers uh, this early into the solution process, if that's what thrills you. You can put these uh, uh, little equations on the side, resolve that into a rounded number. This is a rounded number, it will actually go on forever because it's a sine of an angle. And then this also a rounded number here. And then on your triangle, you can say this is 5 pounds, you can say this is 0 0.868 pounds, and you can say this is 4.92 pounds. And then that gives you a little reality check, like this 5, 4.92, yeah, that's almost as big as this, and this is about a sixth of that. Okay, so that gives you a little check. Um, if you start introducing numbers in this early rounded numbers, you'll get more round off error in your result. If you don't care about that, then yeah, go ahead and throw these numbers in as early as you want. Okay, and at this time, or probably earlier, you might have been thinking, uh, hold up, how did you uh, get all those angles on there? How, do you, how are you sure those are right? You know, where are you getting these numbers from? Okay, now one of my favorite things about this question is uh, there's all these finicky small angles, so your geometry game must be on point in order to get all the solution stuff. So let's look at this diagram here, and let's consider how we got from the original diagram to these angles on this free body diagram of A. I copied this straight out of the book, and it draws uh, force P as perpendicular, I mean, as parallel to the top surface of this ramp, and it indicates the ramp is 10 degrees above the horizon, so that's where I get this 10 here. Uh, prefer preferentially, if I were uh, designing this thing, I would have made a little indicator there that it's parallel, or drawn another 10 degree indicator there, but anyways, that's where I got that. It's drawn parallel to this, which is measure measured to the horizontal. Now this 5 degree angle, how did I get this? This this is the sort of informal way that I think of it this way. So this is, top surface of this ramp is 10 degrees to horizontal. Now this indicator here is saying that this angle, the angle of this surface to this surface is 15 degrees. So I just kind of like, uh, think of it this way, is put your hands like this, and now for this 10 degree angle, incline them both 10 degrees to that, and then for this 15 degree angle, incline this one 15 degrees to that. So the 10 of these and 15 of those, well, these are in opposite directions, so you can say uh, cancel out 10 of one and 10 of the other, and this is 5 degrees left. That's the informal way. If you wanted to be more formal about it, you could take this diagram here, draw this horizontal line here, and now the top surface of that ramp, This I'm exaggerating the angles here, and now you can draw this as 10 degrees. And now you can draw another horizon here, and then from that geometry rule that says, okay, uh, well, these two are parallel, and that's 10 degrees to that, so that's 10 degrees to that. And now you can draw this angle here, that's uh, the surfaces A and B where they meet, and now 15 degrees, that's indicated from there to there is 15 degrees. And now you get, likewise, 15 of these minus 10 of these means this one's 5 degrees. Okay, geometry game's not quite over yet. But that's how we got that 10 degree and that 5 degree there. So let's continue this on. And now... Okay, so the force of gravity here, and I've, I've drawn a 10 degree angle there. Well, we defined our u and v coordinates like this. u is 10 degrees above the horizon this way, and v is perpendicular to u, which means that if u is 10 degrees above the horizon this way, then v is 10 degrees this way of vertical. So that's where I got 
gravity straight down and V 10 degrees to that. So that's where I got that 10 degree angle. Now let's look at this one. And I'm about to show you a diagram of this one. Okay, so this one, this friction force, is five degrees to the horizon. It's five degrees to the horizon there. And then U component is 10 degrees above the horizon. So we got the five degrees below and the 10 degrees above, those add up to 15. And now the vertical ones, so if this one is five degrees below the horizon this way, and this is perpendicular to this, so they go like this. So this one's five degrees below that way, which means that this one is five degrees this way of a vertical line. So this one's five degrees this way of a vertical line like that. And now this component, again, because U is 10 degrees above the horizon and V is perpendicular to U, the angle between V and vertical is 10 degrees. And now I said, I'm gonna show you a diagram of that. There we go. So this five degrees, because this is five degrees this way to vertical, 10 degrees because this is 10 degrees this way to vertical, you add them up and the angle of the triangle is 15 degrees. So that's where I got this 15 degrees. Likewise, the 10 and a five is 15 degrees there. Okay. As with many aspects of this, there are different options on how you can proceed and get to the, the correct answer in a number of different ways. For example, I could have measured all the angles to the U direction and then called sine and cos on those. For example, this triangle, instead of saying that this angle is 10 degrees, I could have said this angle is 80 degrees. And on this triangle, instead of saying, oh, this angle is 15 degrees, I could have said this angle is 75 degrees. And this one, 15 degrees. So that's, uh, this is the U component I'm measuring this angle to the U. This is the U component I'm measuring this angle to the U. Uh, this is the U component measuring this angle to the U. If I do this, then all these are measured to the U. And then I can say that all the U components are gonna call on a cos. So this is U component, U component, U component. These are all gonna call cos, and none of them are gonna call sine. Likewise, if I do that, the V components, this one, this one, and this one, all of these are gonna call sine, 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 and none of the V components are gonna call cosine. That's a neat little, uh, gives you a check because then when you do the algebra and you do the force balances, you're gonna have one equation where all the trigonometry terms are cos and all the trigon another equation where all the trigonometry calls are sine. However, if I had to pick between that and the way that I actually did do this, I prefer it this way because this is more intuitive. Like I just told you how I reckoned those 10 and 15 degree angles. That's the most intuitive way to reckon those angles. And so if you do it this way, the disadvantage of that is that this is not so intuitive to say this is 75 degrees and to say this is 80 degrees. It's not quite as intuitive as saying that's 10 degrees and that's 15 degrees. So there's little advantage and disadvantage to each one. If you do it this way, you get the little check with all your cosines in one line and all your sines in the other line, but the angles are less intuitive. If you do it this way, the angles are more intuitive, but then your equations are going to each have a mix of, of sines and cosines in them. And that brings us to the topic of redundancy. Uh, in ordinary parlance, the word redundancy has a negative connotation, but in the engineerings, the word redundancy has a positive connotation. For example, a large airplane may have three oil pumps that are all redundantly connected to the same inputs and outputs, and that way if one of them fails, you can switch on one of the other ones, and if two of them fails, you can switch on the last one. And that's going to prevent many people from dying, because if the hydraulic oil pump on an airplane fails, then uh, you can't control the control surfaces and you'll crash for sure. Likewise uh, with the spider web. Uh, so this is a good spider web. This one has uh, fewer radial lines, but just as many circumferential lines as the good one. This one has just as many radial lines, but fewer circumferential lines than the good one. And let's say that uh, there's one spider who built his web like this, and one who built his web like this, and one who built his web like this. If a uh, small and slow-moving fly bumps into this one, another one to this one, another one to this one, then uh, all their s spiders are going to have lunch that day. Although if a particularly big and fast moving fly hits this one and another one, this one and another one, this one, it might break through this one and break through this one and not break through this one. And if all three spiders happen to be very hungry that day, this is the one who's going to survive and the one who built this one, the one who built this one are going to starve to death that day. So that is an 
as an example of how redundancy is a very good thing to have. And your brain is shaped very much like a spider web, and uh, having different ways to traverse it is very much like how thoughts and reasoning works, and an exam is very much like a ballistic test of a spider web. So, just as the airplane designer who builds redundancy into his oil pumps, just as the spider who builds redundancy into his design of his web all survive, the student who builds redundancy into his synapses will prevail on an exam where others do not. And the way I just showed you, there's different ways to reckon those angles and call sine and cos on them. Those are redundantly equivalent. If you know both of those ways, you get to choose which one of those you want to do. And speaking of redundancy, how did I draw this friction force this way and not this way? How did I? Th it's because this is the right way, but how did I know that? Okay, well, there's two redundantly equivalent ways to deduce that. So this is body A. And the force is, applied force is this way, so there's going to be a tendency for it to move this way. The body that we are considering, A, to move this way. The friction force will be in the direction opposite to the, tendency, the direction of the tendency for this one to move. Another way you can figure the same thing is you can think of um, B is going to be moving this way relative to A. So you imagine, like, I mean, B is going to be a static to the ramp, A is going to be sliding over there. But if you imagine you attach the little camera onto A that always moves along with A, what that camera is going to see, it's going to appear that B is moving this way relative to A. So you can also say that the friction force is in the same direction as the way that the other body is moving relative to this one. So if you understand it in both of those ways, you have that redundancy, and you can just check both of those and make sure that they agree. And by the way, if you got the wires crossed in your brain and uh, you think that, uh, oh, uh, well, uh, A is, uh, B is moving this way relative to A, so the friction force is in the opposite direction, well, you just got it all mixed up. But Anyways, there's a huge number of those redundancies that go into a solution like this, and uh, if you strive to have redundancies in the way you understand things, you are going to avoid a lot of mistakes throughout a solution like this. Okay, returning to the page we were on, I mentioned we're going to do a pair of force balances, and you might be wondering, um, don't we usually have uh, three balances we can do on each body? Like, uh, normally you'd say, uh, balance the forces in the x direction and the y direction and moments around some given point on any given body well in the way the questions posed we didn't get any distance units it doesn't tell us how tall this is or how far anything is from anything else so if we were to do moments around any given point on any given body that's going to result in a bunch of unknowns and uh, basically it's never going to get us any inferences, it's never going to give us any clues that help us combine with anything else. So this is always going to be a dead end if you take moments around any point on any given body in this in this problem. Um, so normally you do forces, balances in X and Y, or since we defined our inclined coordinate system U and V, you can do force balance in U and force balance in B. If you do all four of these, uh, then two of those are going to, equations that result from that are going to be redundantly equivalent to two of the other equations. In that sentence, the word redundant does have a negative connotation. So anyways, we're going to do these two force balances on A, and that's going to give us two equations, and that's uh, the best we can do that way. And on body B, we're going to do these two force balances, and um, in total, that's going to be four equations from, from balances. And that's the most we can do that are going to be useful. Okay, onward. Now, we have U and V components for this, this, and this. That's the gravity, the force friction, the force normal between A and B. Additionally, we have expressed fr force friction BA and its components in terms of force normal BA. Oh, yes, right. So there's a few things I didn't mention here. Uh, I did mention all this and all this. And like I said, as soon as you see force friction in an equation, we're going to sub in 0 0.25 times force normal as soon as we can. So this U component and V component, one was force friction cos 15, one was force friction sine 15. Now right away we're going to say, actually it's 0 0.25 times force normal times cos 15, and 0 0.25 times force normal times sine 15. So now, this, 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 
and this are all expressed in, term, in terms of force normal, and none, none are expressed in terms of force friction now. Okay, so we're going to do a pair of force balances on A. Like I said, that's two equations and two unknowns. And uh, uh, force P has no V component because it's already in line with U at that angle. And so this system is a little easier than a general two equations to unknown system. We can do force balance in the V direction on A and get some results and then do uh, the force balance in the other direction and just have one unknown and solve for that. Now, and here's here we start to do that. So what I've done here is I've gone general then specific. So I've, I've outlined the plan and then executed it. Now, if your understanding of this stuff is shaky, you would probably prefer that I show you the specific and then the general, as in do these equations, solve for whatever thing, and then explain like uh, why that approach was the one that works. If your understanding of this stuff is strong, then you probably prefer that I go general than specific. Okay, that brings us to this topic of progress improvement in your understanding. Solution by dead reckoning. What does this mean? Solution by dead reckoning means you, you get the question and you just start throwing in some, drawing some free body diagrams, writing the balance equations and the equations, and then you see what's up. You look at those equations and you think, oh, okay, well, it looks like uh, I'd be able to solve for the thing I'm trying to get by doing this. Okay. If you want to improve, the way to do that is practice, redundancy, and introspection. And, and if you do these practices, you will be able to do a solution by planning first. Now, you might be at this level right now, or you might be at this level right now. If you are at this level right now, I would recommend that you strive to be at this level sometime soon. If you are at this level now, I would be willing to bet that you started sometime before at this level and then did these things to achieve this. If you are good enough that you can do a solution by planning first, that's less wasted time because you know which things are going to be dead ends and then you don't bother indulging in those dead ends and uh, all the things you do are things that, that are getting you toward the solution. So practice, there's no substitute for practice. Uh, if you're going to be able to plan ahead, it's because you have so much practice that you uh, know what things are going to turn into. Redundancy, like I said, have multiple ways of understanding how a thing works then you can, you can pick between them, you can d figure out which, which ones have advantages you want and then pick which one you want that's going to work better. Introspection means that as once you get a solution, say you're doing some homework, once you get a solution, don't throw that away and just start doing your next homework question. Look at your solution and ask yourself why, which things led to dead ends, which parts of these led to the steps that got me to those solution, and why? Okay, so this is the direction of get good, and these are necessary but not sufficient conditions. Uh, that means if you want to get good, you need to do these things, although there are other things you need to do, such as, you know, understanding the concepts in the course, being able to type quickly on a calculator, and all the rest. Okay. So, sum of forces in the V direction equals zero for body A. Now, in this line, I've said uh, the force normal equals the force gravity V component plus the force friction V component, a V component of each of those. That's because, uh, let's see, the V component, this one's down, down and a little to the right. This one's down and a little to the right. This one's up and a little to the left. And by the way, these forces are not drawn to scale because there's so many tiny, uh, tiny angles. I haven't drawn these to scale. If I drew these to scale, this triangle would be exactly a quarter of the size of this one. But... You know, if this is about as small as you want to draw a triangle on this page, and I didn't want to draw this one like, well, that'd be like this big. So I didn't draw these to scale. Components are to scale to, to the uh, diagonals. Anyways. So on this side of the equation, I have put the one that's up and a little to the left. And on this side of the equation, I have put the two terms that are down and a little to the right. Now, there's a redundantly equivalent way you could have done this. And that is, you call the force balance, and then you say this term minus this term minus this term equals zero. So this one's positive because it's in this way, this one's negative because it's this, this way, and this one's negative because it's this way. Okay, now this is, this is sort of better practice because this, this equation does mirror this equation. You've put a, a sum of a bunch of things here and a zero on this side, and then you start rearranging them. So this is one of, another one of those things that's sort of like skipping a half step. 
you could say it's a matter of preference, or you could say that, yeah, this one's kind of skipping a half step. So the way I do it is, yeah, the force is one way on one side of the equal sign, the force is the other way on the other side of the equal sign, and then start rearranging. Again, both of those methods are going to get you to the same answer. You decide which one's your preference. Okay. So, force is one way on this side, equal force is the other way on that side. I want to isolate for force NBA1, so I'm going to move this friction term to the left side because now we're going to express this V component as force normal times the cos of that angle. The V component of force friction is a quarter times force normal times the sine of that angle, and the V component of gravity is this. I'm just ripping those all from here that we've already expressed that way. And now to isolate this, we can just factor out the force NBA multiplied by, uh, in brackets, the multipliers, this from this, and this, and this from this, uh, equals this, and that's just some number and the unit's pounds. And now finally, to isolate this, divide all by this. So we got force NBA equals this stuff over this stuff, and that's what this is. These now are all numbers. You can plug these into your calculator and get 5.464 pounds. And now when we do the force balance in the U direction, uh, now the P term is there, but we've just solved for this, and we know this is a quarter of this, and this is given all, all along. So now there's only one equation left, and, uh, one unknown left, and we got one in, unknown in one equation. We can definitely solve for this now. So we got first the balance. P1 was, recall, in this direction, left and a little down. And on the same side of this equation, force gravity U component, left and a little down. On this side of the equal sign, force normal U component, right and a little up. Uh, force friction U component, right and a little up. So these are the ones that are this way, and these are the ones that are this way. Okay. Now isolate P1 by subtracting this, move that to that side. And now express the U components in terms of these things we've already done. Force normal sine 15, quarter of force normal cos 15, this is 5 sine 10 degrees pounds. And now factor this out to make it as clean as possible. These are the multipliers of this. And now these are all numbers. This is 5.464 that we just got from the last equation. And these are all numbers and uh, sine and cosine of numbers that you can type into your calculator. Finally get the value of P1. And the reason why I'm doing this with gloves on is because I, I have a lot of like scars all over my hands and arms. If you saw me with short sleeves and no gloves on, you'd think I look like a drug addict. Um, those scars are because of uh, something I call speed training, a certain type of speed training called cat kung fu. It's a type of speed training that will make you very fast. It will also make you very stabbed. It's also a uh, tip of the hat to buy heart, I guess. Okay, we solved for P1, the amount of force P that will cause motion, assuming mode 1 is what happens. Careful! That's the meaning of that. We don't know if mode 1 will happen. Maybe mode 2 will happen. We have not yet determined whether mode 1 or mode 2 will happen. So this is that check thing. Now, if you're doing the hedge your bets mode, this is when you'd go straight to mode 2, solve for P2, and then just compare P1 and P2. So this is that check that's going to be a little quicker. Uh, we're going to draw a free body diagram of B and solve for these two things, and then we're going to compare them, the, the friction force between the wall and B and the, nor the normal force between the wall and B. If force friction is less than mu force normal between the wall and B, that means the friction between the B and the ramp is indeed sufficient to keep B static as A slides over B. If we solve for these and find that force friction is greater than mu times force normal, that means there never was enough friction between B and the ramp to hold that still as mode 1 happens, and mode 1 is not what happens. Okay. And so, here's our free body diagram. This was given the weight of B. These we just solved for, force friction between A and B. Well, we solved for of B on A, force normal, which was this way, now this is equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. We solved for force friction of B on A, which was this way, this is equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. So we know their magnitudes and their directions. This is just our U and V components again. Recall, in mode 1, force friction equals mu times force normal between A and B, but force friction does not equal mu times force normal between the wall and B. So we do not know the ratio of this to this. This does not equal a quarter of this. So, how many unknowns are here? One, two. These are two unknowns. 
and we can do two force balances and we'll get two equations and two unknowns and even nicer these uh, directions are in line with these directions so if we do a force balance in the v direction this one won't be present we can solve for this one do a force balance in the u direction and this one won't be present and we can solve for this one Okay, let's resolve the uh, force gravity and force normal AB and force friction AB into U and V components. Sort of redundant, not really redundant, but this is just this, but the other way around. So this one's this way, this one's this way. This is just this, but the other way around. So this one's this way, well, whereas that one was that way. And very similar things here. The force gravity on A was 5 pounds. Force gravity on B was 15 pounds. Components work very similarly. Now, force balance in the V direction. So force normal wall B was that way, and it's all exactly in the V direction. That's why we didn't have to resolve it and draw a triangle. And that way, force friction AB is this way, and an equal sign, so the one on this side, down and right, this one, down and right. Very similar rearrangements that we just seen. Uh, we're going to express force friction in terms of force normal. So these are all numbers, and this is the one we just found on the previous page or two pages ago. And you can plug that into a calculator and get this value for force normal wall B. Sum of the forces in the U direction equals zero. Force friction wall B, again, that was exactly in the U direction, so uh, we didn't draw a triangle for it, and that one was this way. That's the only thing on this side of the equal sign because this one and this one and this one, down and left, and left and down, and left and down. Okay, very similar rearrangement thing again. And we've now solved for force friction wall B. Note, these values of force normal wall B and force friction wall B for mode 1 are speculative as part of our check to determine if mode 1 is the right mode. Okay, I just said a bunch of this stuff. If it's less than 0.25, then mode 1 is indeed the mode because there is more than enough friction there. If it's more than 0.25, then there was never enough friction between the wall and B for mode 2 and for mode 1. Okay, so force friction wall B over force normal wall B in mode 1. Is it less than 0.25? Here's those numbers we just got on the previous page, and we take the quotient of them, and it's 0 0.27. So now we have 0.27 is less than 0.25. No, our check has failed. So the inequality 0.27 is less than 0.25 indicates an impossibility. It means that there was a false assumption. The false assumption was the assumed premise that mode 1 is the mode. And now, as I said, we're going to learn some formal logic. Um, since the assumed premise of mode 1 has led to an impossibility, we now know that the assumed premise was wrong. Mode 1 is not the mode. Since there are only two possible modes, and we just proved it's not mode 1, then it must be mode 2. Most of the work up until now was under the false premise. There is a much work left to find min p for mode 2, although less diversions uh, in this discussion of it. Okay, well, I said there's going to be uh, just enough uh, formal logic, linear algebra, and TI programming discussion to be super useful. Uh, that might have been a lie. This little formal logic diversion is mostly just for fun, not particularly useful. But I want to show you what you're going to learn in formal logic if you ever take that course. So we had mode 1. Now this was an assumed premise. Assumed premise was that mode 1 might be the one that happens, and let's just see what it leads to. And then there was, it led us to a bunch of things, and then from that we concluded that 0.27 is less than 0.25. This is a contradiction. When uh, an assumed premise leads to a contradiction, you draw the line like that. And that means that whatever your assumed premise was, was wrong, because it led to a contradiction. So then we can say, it is not the case that mode 1 happens. And from much earlier, we also said that either mode 1 will happen or mode 2 will happen. And since we proved here that mode 1 does not happen, uh, this is called, well, this, this part was called a reductio ad absurdum. And then you combine this statement with this statement. It, either it was mode 1 or it was mode 2. It was not mode 1. Therefore, it's mode 2. This little uh, logical argument is called a disjunctive syllogism. And this is what I just said all this stuff here. We've proved that mode 2 is the mode. Um, if you find this formal logic stuff arousing, then uh, please take a course on formal logic, especially if you are a student in university for engineering and a course on formal logic is not part of the curriculum, please take one anyways, and while you're at it, uh, kick your course direct curriculum designer in the balls for me while you're at it.
Okay, analysis of mode 2 begins, and let's recall that in mode 2 there's the force there, there's sliding here between B and the ramp, no sliding here between A and B, um, so they're sliding together like that with no relative motion between them. Because the sliding is here, there is uh, the friction force there will be maxed, which means that force friction equals mu times force normal here between B and the ramp. But because there is no sliding here, the friction force there is not maxed, which means that the friction force does not equal mu times force normal there. Ideally, uh, if, <laughs> if everything has gone right, it, force friction will be less than mu times force normal there. So in mode 2, we do know the ratio of the friction force to the normal force here. It's a quarter. We do not know the ratio of the friction force to the normal force here in mode 2. And that's what all this says. Now, on the next page, this is another one of those things where I'm going to explain the plan of attack for how to work out all the algebra before showing you the algebra. And if your uh, level of proficiency on this is less than proficient, you would probably prefer that maybe I show you the algebra first and then explain why that plan of attack worked. Let's just look ahead a little bit. So on the next page we do start that algebra after explaining that plan of attack. On the next page after that we get to the answer in a box. On the next page after that, uh, page 10 now, we do some redundant checks just to make sure all parts of that solution are consistent. And then on page 11 and 12, we do an alternate solution. And we're in that alternate solution, we are going to use a solver for systems of linear equations. And if you don't know what that is, good news, you're about to learn what that is once we get to those, those pages, uh, page 11 and 12. Okay, and also, uh, Another one of those uh, random studenting skills is if you have an ordered stack of papers and you move one from the top to the bottom, it pre preserves the order, but also if you take any number of them and move them from the top to the bottom, it still preserves the order. So the whole time I'm doing this, just pick up any number of them, move them from the top to the bottom. They're still in order. Okay, that might help you someday. Uh, where are we? So now 11, you just go like that. Uh, okay, page number number seven. Okay, this plan of attack. So let's look at those free body diagrams again. There's B and there's A. Okay, and we're going to start using the subscript 2 because now it's mode 2, whereas before we were using the subscript 1 to indicate mode 1. And here's those two free body diagrams from before. These all have ones in the subscripts because I didn't redraw them, but now if you imagine all these ones in the subscripts are now 2, uh, then Basically, we have the, our free, free body diagrams for mode 2. Now, in mode 1, we knew the, the ratio of one of these to the other, the, the friction force and normal force between A and B. So we could treat these two as one unknown. We could treat these two as one unknown. Um, but now in mode 2, we do not know the ratio of one to the other. Uh, so we've got to treat these as two different unknowns. Treat these as two different unknowns. Although, in mode 2, as in mode 1, these two are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, the forces from A on B and the forces from B on A, uh, equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. These two, as well, equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. So we can treat these as the same item when we're dealing with just the magnitudes. Treat these two as the same item. In mode 1, we did not know the ratio of these two, the force friction and the force normal between the ramp and B. In mode 2, we do know the ratio of these. This is a quarter of this. So in mode 2, we can treat these two as one unknown. Now, I've been making a lot of use of this talk of uh, x number of linear equations and y number of unknowns. Um, if you haven't heard of this stuff before, great, you're going to learn a lot today. But when x equals y, when I'm saying the number of equations is equal to the number of unknowns, then we can solve for the values of all the unknowns. Like all the times that I said one equation in one unknown or two equations in two unknowns, we could solve for all those values. When y is greater than x, in other words, the number of unknowns is more than the number of equations, then we can't solve for the values of all the unknowns. And in general, we can't solve for any of the values. Um, for example, if when I say one equation in two unknowns or two equations in three unknowns or five equations in 21 unknowns, that means uh, we can't solve for them and have to do something else if we want to get those values. And there was an asterisk here. Uh, when you got equal numbers of equations and unknowns, you'll be able to solve for all of them. Uh, unless you, some of your equations are redundantly equivalent, in which case it's going to count as you have uh, fewer of them, or if they're contradictory. If you have two statements that are leading you to contradictory conclusions, then uh, either you've made a mistake somewhere or the guy who posed the question to you is lying or has crafted a, his problem wrong. 
Okay, and I've assumed we're, uh, d we don't know how to use a solver for systems of linear equations, and I'm assuming we have only the most rudimentary of algebra skills. Um, so I've optimized this solution to be as easy as possible on the algebra, although it does get pretty intense that way because this is a tough problem to solve. Okay, um, so let's suppose we do two force balances on this and two force balances on this. How many equations is that for? How many unknowns is that? The P2 is one, these are two, and these two count as one. So that's one, one more, and two more for a total of four. So we'll have four equations and four unknowns, which means we can solve for all of those. But if we have only the rudimentary algebra skills, we can't solve a general system of four equations and four unknowns. So we'll have to have some kind of plan of attack for isolating uh, one at a time or something like that. Uh, so let's consider just A. If we do two force balances on this, how many unknowns? One, two, three. That's two equations, three unknowns. So it's not going to be that easy. If we do two force balances on this, how many unknowns is that? One, two, three. That's two equations, three unknowns. It's not going to be that easy. Okay, so that's what all this says. Now, what exactly is meant by counting two unknowns as one because we know the ratio of the one to the other? What it means technically is we have five equations and five unknowns. So those unknowns are one, two, three, four, five. And those five equations are a couple of force balances on body B, a couple of force balances on body A, and the equation force friction wall B2 equals mu times force normal wall B2 with mu being a known value. But this equation is so simple that as soon as we see force friction wall B2, in an equation, we're right away just going to sub in a quarter of uh, force normal wall B2. So we know that we can just get this thing out of any equations as soon as we see it. And then this will be one of the other unknowns. And then we say that, um, well, ignore this, and we got four equations, the two balances on the two bodies each, in four unknowns, counting these two as one. Well, technically we have seven equations and seven unknowns. Those, uh, because we're, we were treating these two as one thing and these two as one thing, but if you want to treat them as two different things, because they do have two different names, these are two different names, one goes A, B, one goes B, A, and these are two different names, uh, then how many unknowns? We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven unknowns, and our seven equations are the two force balances on A, the two force balances on B, force friction equals mu times force normal for between the wall and B, and force normal AB equals force normal BA, and force friction AB equals force friction BA. So really, really technically, we've got these seven equations and seven unknowns. But because all these three equations are so simple, uh, we're treating that as four equations and four unknowns effectively, and treating it that way does work. Okay, okay, plan of attack. And I'm not going to read you that paragraph. I've got a little point form version of it here. Okay, so as I said, if we do the pair of force balances on B, we'll have one equation in, we'll have two equations in three unknowns. That's uh, one, two, and three. And what we can do is we can boil that down to one equation in two unknowns. See, if we do the force balance in the V direction here, that'll be one, two, three unknowns. And if we do the force balance in the U direction, that will be one, two, three unknowns. And then if we take that first equation and we express it as this is some function of these two things. And in the second of those, we got this, we sub it in for a quarter of these. And now we get this in the form of this equals some other function of these two things. So that's what I'm saying here. Uh, one of those is going to be this is some function of these two things. That other equation is going to get us to the same thing equals some other function of these two same unknowns. And then, because this equation has just one of these guys on the left, and this equation has just one of these guys on the left, this equals this, so this equals this. We equate these two, and that's what this line is. Function one of these two things equals function two of these two things. And these two are these two. So now this is one equation in two unknowns force normal AB and force friction AB. Then we can do a, a force balance in the V direction on A. Uh, force P would not be present in that one because it is already in line with U. So the force balance in the V direction will have one equation in two unknowns. One equation in two unknowns, force normal BA and force friction BA. So 
are two force balances on B boiled down to this one equation and these two unknowns. Our force balance in the V direction on A boiled down to one more equation in these two unknowns. And hey, what do you know? The same two unknowns. So you combine this equation and this equation, and that is now two equations in the two unknowns, the force normal and force friction between A and B. Then we can solve for those. And then we have only one force balance left in our arsenal, the force balance in the U direction for body A. And we just solved for these two, we got values for them. That leaves one remaining unknown. That balance will become one equation in one unknown P2. And we can solve for the value of it. And that's what all this says. Now do. We are going to set up these equivalency things for the components, and we can just adapt those from before that we had from B. Okay. These uh, U and V components for force gravity are all the same. U and V components for force normal are all the same. Only now we're just turning these subscript 1s into subscript 2s. So that's what all this is. Oh, I didn't put subscript 1s and 2s for the force of gravity because it's equal. Uh, in both modes. Now, up here when we did the force friction, remember in mode one we knew that force friction equals a quarter of force normal, so we uh, put those values in right up in this step. But now force friction between A, B is not some known ratio to force normal. And so here in these components uh, we've stopped short of that. So now we're just saying uh, this but with a subscript 2 equals this but with a subscript 2. And likewise for this one. Okay, next, so force balances. I'm not going to go through all of the particulars every time, but we do force balance in the V direction on body B. Uh, things in one way on one side of the equal sign, things the other way on the other side of the equal sign. We want to isolate one of these on this side, so we're going to subtract this from both sides to put it there. That's what this is. And now sub in all these equivalent things, so this line express doesn't express things in terms of components anymore. It expresses it in terms of unknowns we want times trig functions, and we have now isolated one of these on the left side. So force balance in the U direction on B, forces one way on one side, forces the other way on the other side. Uh, sub in a quarter of force normal wall B2 for force friction wall B2, and then sub in these equivalent things for components here. And finally, going to multiply both sides by 4 in order to get one of these on the left, and that's what this is. These things are all these multiplied by 4, and now we got this equation is one of these things on the left equals all this. This equation is one thing, this one thing on the left equals all this, and this, these are in terms of the same unknowns. So now, because this is the same as this, we can say that all this must equal all this, and that's what the next line is. It says that all this equals all this. Now, what we have done, we've gotten this far in this plan. So we did the two force balances on B, and what we've just done is boiled that down to one equation and two unknowns by saying this one function of these two unknowns is equal to this function of these two unknowns. Now to prepare it for combining later, we want to isolate again. So we've got these two unknowns, force normal AB2 and force friction AB2. I am going to choose to try to isolate force normal AB2 onto the left side. So there's force normal AB2, there's these two terms, one on each side of the equal sign. So you're going to subtract this from both sides, and that's that. These two are these two, but with this moved over to this side. Force friction AB2, we've got one term on each side of the equal sign as well. And we want to put them both on the right side of the equal sign, so we're going to subtract this from both sides. And now that's what this is. These two are these two, but with this on this side of the equal sign. And finally, the constant terms, this one is this, and we want to put this on the right, so subtract this from both sides. These two constant terms become these two constant terms. So now we got force normal AB2 terms on the left, everything else on the right. Now we're going to factor out force normal AB2. So this is now force normal AB2 times this thing in brackets. This comes from this, comes from this, comes from this. And force friction AB2, we want to factor that out as well. So this is uh, force friction AB2 times this thing in brackets. This comes from this, this comes from this. We'll left these the same in this step. And now we can finally express 
force normal AB2 on the left side of the equal sign by dividing all terms by this. So this says force normal AB2 equals this quotient of force friction AB2. This quotient is simply this over this. And this constant term is simply this over this. And now we have force normal AB2 equals some function of force friction AB2. And you may have noticed that I like to keep things in uh, exact form for perhaps a little longer than ideal. But in the very next step, I do around these. So this next line just says uh, all this stuff equals uh, approximately, and squiggly equal sign by the way, equals uh, negative 59.445, and all this equals uh, approximately 62.771. So now we got this equals some function of this. And now, next thing to do is uh, force balances on A. Uh, force, first we'll get these uh, component equivalences ready, and like Wise, they are adapted from an earlier page. Uh, directions are all the same. These all the same as these. These same as these. Just uh, sub in the two for the one. And remember, we don't equivocate force friction BA with a quarter of force normal BA in mode two. So we stop there. That term's that term. Stop here. This term is this term. Okay. Force balance in the v-direction, force is one way on one side, force is the other way on the other side. We want to isolate force normal BA2 on one side, which it already is there, so this is just subbing in the values for components. So we're expressing these in terms of the unknowns we want instead of in terms of components. And to isolate this on one side, we just divide all by this. So now we got this equals this function of this. Sub in approximate values now. So this is approximately 0.26 and this is approximately 5.09. And now we have from our pair of force balances on B, this is some function of this. From our one force balance on A, we got this is some function of this. And what do you know? This equation has force normal AB2 on one side. This equation has just force normal AB2 on this side because this is clearly the same as this. That means all this equals all this. And that's what the next line says is that all this is equal to all this. Finally, collect like terms. There's one of these on this side, one of these on this side, so add this many to both sides, get that on that term. There's a constant on both sides, so subtract this from both sides, get that on that term. And then, finally, divide both sides by this, and we have a value for force friction BA2, and that is approximately 0 0.96585 pounds. And now, if we want to get the value for force NBA2, we'll need that later. That is a very simple matter of taking this value and plug it into this equation, and you will get 5 point whatever for this. Optionally, you could also take the same value, plug it into that equation, and we hope, as long as we haven't made any mistakes, that both of these equations will come up with the same value if you plug this into this or plug this into this. And that will be this, one, this many. Okay. Uh, now there's only one force balance left that we can possibly do. I should mention, uh, in the question, it should have mentioned that assume that sliding will occur and that tipping will not occur. Uh, and it, it's going to depend on the dimensions of these boxes. Like, it didn't say their dimensions, which means that, um, and you know, you never should never scale off the diagram, which means that these boxes might be very narrow and tall, or they might be very stout and wide. If they're actually very narrow and tall, then you're going to get tipping. If they're very stout and wide, you're going to get sliding. Um, so they should have said assume sliding and no tipping. Anyways, uh, final force balance left we can do. U direction balance on A. Force is one way on one side, force is the other way on the other side. And we just got the values of these two here. Uh, we want to isolate this one final unknown on the left by subtracting this from both sides, put it on that side. And now express the components in terms of the unknowns we want and the trig functions. And would you look at that? This is known, this is a number, this is known, this is some number, this is this, and all these are numbers now. Type that into your calculator and you get the value of P2 equals 1.45 pounds. 
and uh, we're going to mention the mode here, but, you know, the question had no mention of mode 1 and mode 2. Those are some nomenclature that we made up along the way, so we want to express our answer in terms of things that make sense given just the question, such as A and B slide together down the ramp with no relative motion between A and B, which is our verbal definition of mode 2. And since P2 is less than P1, that means P2 is the mode that will happen, which means that this is the answer we want. And speaking of keeping exact numbers or introducing rounded numbers and when you should do that, it's likely that different teachers will want you to take different approaches that way. And if you've got different teachers for different courses, that's a good thing because different approaches that way are appropriate for different courses. For example, in calculus class, you probably want to keep your uh, numbers in exact form even to the when you're reporting the solution at the end. Um, like if you're learning how to do derivatives of trigonometric functions, it wouldn't make sense to start putting in rounded values early, as early as possible. In a course like this, statics or other physics courses, um, I think it's pretty typical that a, a teacher will want you to report the solution to three sig figs. And then if you're doing that, well, if you're, if you're putting in rounded numbers early or even in the middle of this game and you're, you're only reporting them to three digits and then you're typing them into your calculator into three digits, you're going to have a lot of round off error and your, your solution that you report is probably only going to be good to two digits. Your third digit's probably going to be off. Whereas when you introduce the approximated numbers, if you keep them to five sig figs and keep typing them into your calculator as five sig figs and then only round down to three once you've got the solution that you're reporting right at the end, then this is likely to be good to three sig figs. And I think I had one teacher once who said report your answer to three sig figs and then I was doing stuff like this, keeping five in the in the intermediate values and then he was docking marks saying, oh, you reported those to too many sig figs and then uh, instead of uh, starting to report intermediate values to three sig figs, what I would do is I'd put a little note by the solution saying, this solution is reported to three sig figs, whereas more digits are shown in the intermediate values just in order to reduce round off error. And then I would continue to report these to five and this to three. And because of that note there, he stopped docking marks. That is very stupid. Um, but yeah, if, if your teachers want you to do uh, the, one way for calculus course and another way for f physics course, that makes perfect sense. And as you may have noticed, this is not just a walkthrough on how to do one physics thing. There has also been much discussion on requisite skills, and such a set of discussions would not be complete without some words on calculator kung fu. And I have not yet typed anything into the calculator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to calculate that in exact form, not because that's uh, there's any good reason for that, but just to give you an idea of how nimble you want to be on the calculator. And uh, bear with me for just one second, because I'm working with some awkward angles here with the lamp and stuff. Um, but recall, when you call a trigonometric function on the TI, it gives you an opening bracket. So you can type in sine of some number and then closing bracket. Or you can just type in sine of some number and no closing bracket, and the closing bracket is implied. But if you have to type in anything after that, like let's say, for example, I want to say sine of 10 plus cos of 10, I have to go sine of 10, closing bracket plus cos of 10, but then that other second closing bracket can be implied. Okay, so let's see, this should be an angle. Okay, negative 4 cos 15 closing bracket minus sine 15 equals divided by opening bracket 4 sine 15 closing bracket minus cos 15, and that's the right number. Now I'm just going to go negative answer, and I'm going to stow that as A just because I want to stow these as positive values. And now let's continue. 15 cos 10 degrees closing bracket minus 60 sine 10 degrees implied closing bracket equals answer divided by opening closing bracket 4 sine 15 degrees closing bracket minus cos 15 degrees, and that is the right number. I'm going to stow that as B. And next one is simply sine 15 closing bracket divided by cos 15 implied closing bracket. And then I'm going to stow that as C. And then the last term there is 5 cos 10 degrees closing bracket divided by cos 15 equals, and I'm going to stow that as D. And I'm going to cheat here because I have this written down, A plus C. And I'm going to stow that as E. And now uh, B minus D, and I'm going to stow that as F. And finally F divided by E, 
Oh, there it is. 0.96585 uh, and plus whatever comes after that. And now I said exact form, but the calculator isn't actually uh, storing this in exact form in terms of actually still remembering that it's a sine of an angle and a cos of an angle. But what it does is it keeps this to at least this many decimal places. It reports 10 and then it's keeping one or two more. So what this really is doing is uh, it's rounding off just like this is rounding off, but this is rounding it off to approximately 12 digits, whereas this is five. Okay, and now onward. What this says, yeah, P2 is less than P1, so then we know mode two is the mode and that force is lighter than the other one, so this is the answer we want. That means that as you gradually apply that force from nothing to a little more to a little more, the thing starts moving when it's that many and it moves in that mode. Okay, so that's all this. We don't need to do another check because we found both P1 and P2. Um, but let's do a page of redundant checks here. And we're going to compare force friction with force normal. Between A and B, that's the ratio that we don't know yet. And let's take those two numbers that we just found on the previous page, divide them, and you get 0.18, which is less than 0.25, which means that check passes. Speaking of that check and that gambit from before, of course there is a perfect mirror image to that. Just like every gambler's fallacy has perfect mirror symmetry, this gambit also does. That was a horrible comparison and completely pointless. But let's say if we did mode 2 first, and if we want to hedge our bets, we'd go find P2, then P1, and just compare them. But if we wanted to gamble, we can do a check after P2, and then if that passes, then we know the force 2, and this check tells us that uh, mode 2 is indeed the mode, and if that check fails, then we have to solve for this one anyways, and it costs us that much extra work. Although in mode 2, that check is a tiny amount of work, because we've already solved for those things. So that's that gambit. If we had started with mode 2, found all those things, divided that, and found that this is less than this, then that would confirm that mode 2 is the mode, and we wouldn't have to do any of the calculations of mode 1. We could report our answer and know that mode 2 is the mode. Right, and what that means is that the friction between A and B is not maxed, which means that the surface-to-surface -surface contact between A and B is more than frictiony enough to keep uh, prevent a relative motion between A and B as B slides relative to the ramp. Next, more redundant checks is I've uh, calculated the values for our five unknowns. We actually didn't calculate these, but we calculated these three. If you just take these and throw them into earlier equation, e equations and crunch those, you get uh, these values. I've kept them to the 12 uh, digits that this thing stores. And now I've got the force balances here in their original forms that I had them in right after calling the balance. So now we can confirm things like D plus A sine 15 is equal to B cos 15 plus 15 cos 10. These two numbers are exactly equal to the number of digits shown. And you can do the same for these, confirm that all these are fully consistent. Another redundant check that I've done is a, a geometric proof. I have drawn all these forces with their angles and at a scale of one centimeter for one pound. And now we can confirm things like A is five pounds, B is 15 pounds, and this is like three times that. Um, and then the force friction between wall and B and force normal between wall and B, uh, we think that's exactly a quarter. So you go like this and like this, that's one of these, two, one of two of these, and two of two is four. Yeah, that's a quarter of that. And then the force friction between A and B, and the force friction between a, B and A, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, force normal between A and B, force normal between B and A, equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And we'd hope that this is less than a quarter of this. And if you go, yeah, one of these, two, two, and four, yeah, it's less than uh, four of these to one of these. So all these things check. And like I said before, if you got those arrowheads in a cycle, like this arrow is pointing this way, this arrow is pointing this way, and this arrow is pointing this way, and this arrow is pointing this way, and this arrow is pointing this way. So it's like a cycle. That means that all these balances, all these forces balance to uh, equilibrium. And likewise, these arrowheads are all in a cycle. So that's a whole bunch of redundant checks just to make sure that all parts of the solution are consistent.
Okay, and finally we have an alternate solution here. This one's much quicker. Suppose we know how to use a solver for systems of linear equations, and suppose we had guessed mode 2 first. System of two equations and two unknowns. Okay, TI calculator doesn't come with solvers, but it comes with something really close, so you can program them in very easily. If I want to call my solver for systems of two equations and two unknowns, I'll press the program button. And I have a very long list of programs here. I could scroll all the way down to the letter S, or I could just type in letter S, and then it will give me the program starting with S, and I can scroll down to SOL22. That's my solver for a system of two equations and two unknowns. A little quicker is what I've, I've saved a program called A, so I just go program and then enter. Now program is one symbol and A is one symbol, which means you can overwrite that with the name of whatever you want. So what I do is just program, enter, left arrow, and then I type in sol22, two, two, uh, sol22, two, two, and that brings up my solver for a system of two equations and two unknowns. Let's use an example here. Here's a system of two equations and two unknowns. 7x plus 3y equals 1, 4x plus 9y equals 2. And now if I just go 7, enter, 3, enter, 1, enter, 4, enter, 9, enter, 2, enter. And then it says uh, these two values, and, that's, and it saved them as x and y. So now I can call x or y, and so it's the same numbers. Now I can confirm 7x plus 3y equals 1. 4x plus 9. Y. Sorry, I'm looking through the camera lens this time, so I'm very clumsy on the calculator this time. Okay, so that confirms those. That means that anytime you have a system of two equations and two unknowns, if you just set them up into this format, and you just program that into your calculator, then all you got to do is call that program and type in the numbers just like reading them off there. Okay, a very similar for a system of three equations and three unknowns. It's, it's like, okay, I've got three equations with three unknowns, and I've set them up into this form. And I know that this many x's and this many y's and this many z's equals this amount, and this many x's, blah, 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 blah. I set them up all nice like that. What values of x and y and z will solve that? And oh yeah, this is how I write it when I'm detailing a solution. I'll put this little star and say, three equation, three unknown solution. That means I called my calculator for this, and the calculator is going to give us this. I'm assuming we, we know this much, and then we want to find these. And that is as simple as going program uh, sol three three uh, seven and eighty nine ninety four and forty one just like you're reading them right off the thingy thirty two and eighty oh, eighty six twenty four twenty one forty six thirty seven eighty nine and uh, Okay, it looks like that worked, and those are saved as x, y, and z now, and I can go 7x, what the heck? I'm looking through the lens this time, so I'm very clumsy on the calculator now. 7x plus 89y plus 94z, likewise confirm the rest of those, but it's, it's told me, hey, if you got these equations, you want to know what x, y, and z are to satisfy all these, you call that solver and you get these. Now let's look at how I programmed that. Okay, to examine that program, let's press the program button, uh, go over to the edit tab, and uh, type in the first letter, and that'll bring us down close to here, and now let's have a look inside the code. Sol33. So these are, input means it asks the user for an input, and then it stores it as this letter. So first I'm just getting all these inputs from the user and storing them as letters. And then all I'm doing is taking all those letters and building a matrix of them. The matrix means like a two-dimensional array of numbers. Well, it can be in any dimensional array, but on a TI you only got two-dimensional arrays. And then, so all that was just getting and setting, and then this is the one line that computes something. It says RREF of that matrix and store it as a new name. And then these are just getters. It just uh, reads some numbers off of that matrix and then displays them and it tells you that it's saved to those. So RREF is short for reduced row echelon form. And that is a concept from linear algebra. And I will not be uh, explaining what a reduced row echelon form means really theoretically. But let's examine the matrix. After it asked us for the 
inputs, it stored that as C, matrix C. So here's our matrix C, and would you look at that? This is just those numbers that we just typed in and read off here. So that these numbers are all the same as these numbers in the exact same form. And when it did RREF, the reduced row echelon form on C, it saved that as matrix D. And now what we have on the main diagonal is a bunch of ones, and we got for all the columns except for the rightmost, zeros on all the other entries. And what that means was that uh, none of the equations were redundantly equivalent and none of the equations were contradictory. That's what it means when you get ones on the main diagonals and zero for all the other entries for all the columns except for the last one. And the last column is the values we want. Those are these values, the ones that satisfy this equation. So that's all I'm going to tell you about the meaning of RREF. Um, what it means is, you know, uh, if you have this system and you set it up that way, and then you load a matrix up with those numbers just as they're presented there, and then you run RREF on that, what you get is a matrix with some ones and zeros to confirm it works, and you get the values that satisfy that system of equations. So that's all we're learning about RREF today, and that program is just uh, ask for inputs, uh, sets a matrix up, does the one computation that's uh, one computation that's RREF, and then gets the values from that setters and getters, and one computation, and then stores those as x, y, and z, and tells you that it stored them as x, y, and z. Okay, now given that crash course on just what we need to know about linear algebra, let's do a solution. Supposing we know how to use a solver and guessed mode two first. Here's these. Uh, five unknowns, and I haven't even used the incline coordinate system u and v, I've expressed them in terms of x and y, which means that uh, supposing we had done like a fully detailed solution, we wouldn't even need to make these uh, triangles to break the components down to u and v, uh, because we know all the angles, we've measured the angles to the horizon already, so we know these are all cos of 10, sine of 10, cos of 5, sine of 5, and the complements of those 80 and 85. So those are the x components of all five unknowns, the y components of all five unknowns. And here's our four force balances uh, in x direction on A, y direction on A, x direction on B, y direction on B, and uh, relating uh, force friction wall B is a quarter of force normal wall B. That's five equations and five unknowns. The next thing we would have to do in this solution is to rearrange them into the format such that we can type them into the solver. And all you got to do in order to do that is a little uh, algebraic uh, reorganizing the terms. And now each of these lines says uh, some number of force P plus some number of force NBA plus some number of force friction BA plus some number of force normal wall B plus some number of force friction wall B equals some constant. Now I don't have programmed in a solver for five equations and five unknowns here, but we can just go to matrix button and we can make a custom matrix by going edit. Let's call it matrix B. And we're gonna want a matrix that is five numbers by six numbers. That means five numbers tall, six numbers wide. And let's go jump cut. And now I have entered in all those values for matrix B, just read them right off there and typed them all in. They round them all. They show them rounded to a few digits, but they're all actually stored to many digits. And now we can simply go matrix math and call RREF on matrix name B. And we get the ones on the main diagonal and zeros everyone up everywhere else for all the terms except for the rightmost column. And would you look at that? The rightmost column is those values for the five unknowns. As we computed them before, these are the same ones. Okay, and then next uh, we would report those numbers. We don't even need to report all of them. Although in this fictional story, we started by guessing mode two first and then we used our solver. We have not yet confirmed that this is the right answer because now this is P2. Now we would either have to go to mode one and compute the P for mode one, call it P1 if you want, or do that check. So now we would take force friction BA divided by force normal BA, this divided by this, confirm that that's less than 0.25, and then we would know that mode two is the mode, and then we could report that. 
So that confirms mode two is mode that we can report the answer. P equals this many, and then the verbal description of mode two. So that is our second way of solving this, what we call the alternate solution, and that's the last page of this. Uh, so the solution, the first time around, it was 10 pages, uh, lots of discussion, plus all the equations and diagrams and such. Again, if you're writing this on an exam, you'd probably go slightly fewer words. Uh, and then we did redundant checks, and then our alternate solution, just the last two pages. Uh, that's a little misleading. I'm not saying that using a system solver is going to save you 80% of your time comparing uh, two pages to ten pages, because let's say if I had done the solution the first way around, and uh, let's say I'd guessed mode two first on the first time around and been similarly verbose, and let's say I did the solver method way and guessed mode two first and been similarly verbose for that one too, then uh, it wouldn't exactly be one to five. The ratio would be still a very decent savings of, of about like 40% of your trouble really. So what does this all this mean? Because when I was, uh, I have to mention, I am very old, uh, so a lot of these opinions might be outdated, but when I was in high school, we started learning this uh, static friction stuff in like grade 11 physics, um, but we never had heard of that uh, X number of equations and Y number of unknowns stuff. So when I talked about solution by dead reckoning, really all of our solutions had to be by dead reckoning. Like, you couldn't really plan your solution with how much they taught us about the, the theory of the math and stuff. So I would just uh, start writing balances, start uh, drawing free body diagrams and stuff, and then just see whether the algebra pops out as something you could solve for the answer for. Um, and then, uh, let's see, in first year of college, we learned all this stuff again in, in statics, and then it was like, um, yeah, first year math in college is when they taught us that linear algebra. That was kind of maybe second year, really, when they taught us that linear algebra and what that means in terms of number equations and number of unknowns and reduced row echelon form. And it's only after second year of college when I would have been able to use a system solver like this for stuff physics that I learned in 11th grade. Um, so I would recommend that when you're training, doing homework and stuff, use, prefer the system solver. Use it most of the time. But I would also highly recommend that some of the time, just solve it in a, some other way and make sure you're training all your muscle groups. Hit, hit all those muscle groups from as many angles as possible. Um, so sometimes you get the question and you think, okay, solver mode's gonna be the most, the quickest, most efficient way to solve it, and then do that. Sometimes when you get the question and you, you can be like, oh, solver mode's gonna be the quickest, and then just decide, okay, I'm gonna willingly do this in some way that's not necessarily the quickest, uh, just because I wanna make sure I'm training all those skills. As far as curriculum design, you know, I think they should teach you this RREF stuff. Uh, you know, just just in the, the crash course, like not even doing all the theoretical knowledge, but just what it means in terms of building a system solver into your TI, you know, they should be introducing that in, in as soon as 11th grade, but it's been a very, very long time since I've been in a school, so like, uh, I don't want to yell too loud about this or else I'm going to sound like your racist grandfather because I don't know how things are done these days. But, um, you know, I did hear something once that seemed to suggest that the, they are starting to do it more like that these days, so I, I don't really know though. Speaking of pointless and inefficient solution methods, uh, I've decided that here's another way you can do this. Express it as seven linear equations and seven unknowns, and then the force balances on A don't call AB, they all call BA, and the force balances on B all call AB and don't call BA. And then I've got this line here that says that uh, uh, one of these minus one of these is zero, or in other words, this equals this. Another line that says one of these and uh, negative one of these is zero, or in other words, one of these is one of these. So like when I showed you that seven equations, and technically seven equations and seven unknowns. And then I did type those into A, that's what that looks like, and then if we do matrix math RREF on matrix name A, hey it works, okay, one's on the main diagonal, zero's everywhere else, except for in the rightmost column, same values there, and now we have some 
this line 5.356 is the same as this line 5.356 and this line 0.965 is equal to this line 0.965 so you can get as creative as you want in terms of uh, which pointless techniques you want to learn you know as you might have guessed uh, when I'm in the gym and uh, I'm doing my neck curls and wrist curls and calf raises I'm treating those as just as important as the bench press yo never skip leg day and all that Okay, today's document camera presentation has been brought to you by Welfare and Duct Tape. Please help me financially. What's up everybody? I hope you enjoyed that walkthrough. My name again is Junichiro Swanson. And unfortunately, at the time of this recording, I have not made a huge corpus of work. Although I would highly recommend you watch my video lecture called The What and Why of Functional Programming. It was a thousand hours of work to make a two-hour lecture video. It's on computer science and uh, subscribe to both of my channels, check out the catalogs of those, you might see something you enjoy, that cat kung fu video is in there, and at the time of this upload I am also uploading a call for collabs on my other channel. Thanks for stopping by!